if you're told about the theory of relativity, energy equals mass times velocity, or the 20th century's leading scientist, only one name comes to mind. That of Albert Einstein. Who doesn't know him? This great man had not only an outstanding intelligence, but a brain that was worth its weight in gold. And it is because he was worth so much that he was the subject of a great scandal. On April the 18th, 1955, Albert Einstein died in Princeton Hospital in New Jersey. The American pathologist Thomas Harvey was in charge of the autopsy. The autopsy, which was supposed to be a simple formality, created a real scandal. Indeed, while he had the physicist body in his hands, Harvey did a great madness. He subtly removed the brain of the deceased, this great matter that revolutionized the world and called into question certain laws of science. This is the beginning of an improbable and breathtaking story worthy of a Hollywood drama. I'm sure that just like me, you're burning with desire to know a little more about this case. We're going to take a trip back in time, to the time when the late Einstein was in the limelight. We will try to unravel the truth about this incredible disappearance, which was one of the most shaking scandals of the 20th century. On March the 14th, 1874, one of the most influential theoretical physicists in history was born in Ulm, Germany. So much so that his name is now known to everyone, even to those who never went to school. Albert Einstein. This is no ordinary child who is born. Little Albert is a real little genius, and this is noticed very early. Einstein's interest in science was sparked by an ordinary everyday object, a compass. He was not even five years old at the time, but he was already intrigued by this mysterious object that showed the existence of an action at a distance and that seemed to him miraculous. At the age of 12, Albert was strongly influenced by a small book on Euclidean geometry of the plane, which he named the Sacred Book of Geometry, and which had an indescribable effect on him as he declared. Einstein was fascinated by the clarity and certainty of the demonstrations contained in it. His uncle Jacob, an engineer by profession and partner in his father's electrical equipment business, began to introduce him to mathematical problems, which Albert took great pleasure in solving. Einstein often had Max Tomley over for dinner at his family home, a medical student who gave him books on science and later on works by Kant, and with whom he had long and very interesting discussions. The next four years of his life were decisive, because he learned differential and integral calculus on his own and without any help from anyone. We agree, this is not something that could happen in our time. In fact, his whole life was marked out in this way, learning and deepening his knowledge in a completely self-taught way. However, at school, little Albert was an ordinary student, bordering on mediocrity, endowed with an intelligence without flamboyance. Well, in appearance. In fact, in 1895, he failed his entrance exam to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. It is not that he was falsely intelligent. He was simply smarter than normal. In other words, Einstein had an intelligence that did not thrive in traditional teaching methods, especially in non-scientific subjects. His test scores in mathematics and physics were exceptional, but unfortunately, they were not enough to compensate for his lack of success in literary subjects. Despite a disjoint relationship with school, Einstein found his interest and passion in the mysteries of the world. We don't need to tell you everything about his exceptional career, because that's not what matters to us today. We want to know what happened to his brain and why he was so successful after his death. Well, the answer is quite simple. According to what was said, Einstein was extraordinarily intelligent. Not to say that he had something superhuman. This is not just talk, but real post-mortem studies have been done on his brain. 
They revealed that Einstein had an exceptionally developed prefrontal cortex. And it is precisely this rarity that would have helped the physicist to understand the invisible balance of the universe. Thomas Harvey understood this and wanted to deepen his knowledge on this matter by making Einstein's brain his toy. Uh, sorry, his laboratory jewel. On April the 18th, 1955, at 1 a.m., Albert Einstein breathed his last in his sleep at Princeton Hospital. The same morning, at 8 o'clock, his body was taken to the morgue for an autopsy. Thomas Stahls Harvey was in charge. The 43-year-old doctor had been trained at Yale University by his mentor, Harry Zimmerman, a Lithuanian neuropathologist, a leader in the study of central nervous system disorders. Thomas Harvey had in his hands a real treasure. Meticulously, he proceeded to the autopsy of Einstein's remains. He palpated his viscera and opened his ribcage, which contained organs bathed in blood. It took him only a few minutes to understand the cause of death of the great genius. The verdict falls, rupture of an abdominal aorta aneurysm. Quite common. Immediately, the news spread like wildfire and made the rounds of newspaper around the world. The genius of the 20th century, the great Albert Einstein, was gone. And while the whole world was learning about the death of the scientific pioneer, Thomas Harvey was busy with other things. During his lifetime, Albert Einstein had been very clear about his end of life and funeral instructions. The 1921 Nobel Prize winner in physics wanted to be cremated and his ashes scattered in a secret place to avoid worship and to prevent anyone from idolizing his bones. However, he made a small mistake. And yes, it happens even to geniuses. Einstein had talked about the bones, but not about the essential, his brain. Thus, the bones of the genius, which did not really interest Thomas Harvey, were incinerated according to his request. The doctor insisted on following the last wishes of the deceased to the letter, leaving out one small detail. Well, leaving it out on purpose. Indeed, despite the fact that Hans, Albert Einstein's eldest son, was vehemently opposed to any organ removal from his father's remains after the autopsy, the last wish was flouted. Not once, but twice. The first time was when Einstein's ophthalmologist took the eyes of the deceased, and the second was when Thomas Harvey took something even more precious, his brain. This is how he did it. In the mournful silence of the morgue, the pathologist begins a real work of Goldsmith. First, he shaved off Einstein's shaggy hair, scalped him, and removed the scalp to reveal the skull, which he then cut open to reach the brain. Finally, he detaches the organ from the rest of the body with the utmost parsimony. This is the apotheosis. His first reflex is to weight it, naturally. Einstein's brain is 1 kilo 230 grams, a little jewel. And you don't think so because the brain was really worth its weight in gold, even if it was a little less heavy than the average, which is 1300 grams for an adult man. Thomas Harvey then took several pictures of the brain in order to immortalize the organ in its most raw state before deciding to cut it into 240 small pieces. He kept the whole thing in jars filled with formaldehyde, which he placed safely in his trunk before taking the road to Philadelphia. The University of Pennsylvania was one of the few institutions to have a microtome, a rare instrument at that time, like a sausage slicer. If you'll pardon the illustration, the microtome can be used to make extra fine slices of frozen or fixed biological tissue, thin in the micrometer range. These slices are kept between two slides to be observed under the microscope. Harvey will take a total of three months to complete this meticulous work and 12 sets of 100 cuts each. He leaves only a few pieces intact. He then sent the sections to his pathologist colleagues for analysis, because a brain of such great rarity and unequaled brilliance must have hidden mysteries and an immense interest for science. Harvey said about the methodical analysis of Einstein's brain, taking care to record everything in a report. He is animated by a frenetic need to make a revolutionary discovery to serve science. 
The press, confident, follows closely his progress. The New York Times published a front-page article on April 20, 1955. A key clue saw it in Einstein's brain. It was during the publication of this article that Einstein's family learned of the theft of their patriarch's brain. Harvey managed to convince the eldest son Hans to leave him the samples so that he could continue the research, which he accepted in spite of himself. And he was right to be reluctant to let his father's brain travel around the United States, from laboratories to dissecting tables, since Harvey's analysis will eventually prove to be futile. The doctor, far from being an expert of this organ and of the knowledge on the brain, will not be able to differentiate the brain of Einstein from that of the common people. Harvey did not deliver the report to the Einstein Medical Center Philadelphia. As a result, Einstein's brain was forgotten. This will last for more than 20 years. Nobody will talk about him anymore. No scientific publication or article will put the brain of the genius in the spotlight. As for Thomas Harvey, he lost his position at Princeton and took his notes, his personal effects and especially his jars with him. He left the state and suddenly disappeared from the radar. But in 1978, the case is brought back to the forefront when Stephen Levi, a young journalist, receives an exceptional request from his editor. Find the genius brain. He will find Harvey in Wichita, Kansas, who will show him the last pieces of Einstein's cerebellum. A piece of his cerebral cortex and aortic vessels well kept in their famous glass jars, stored in a box. Levi relaunched the machine and speculations were flying everywhere. It is thought that Einstein's brain has more neurons than others and that it has a rear configuration at the level of the sylvius cleft that increases the size of its parietal lobes. But all these speculations do not convince anyone. The only relatively interesting work at the time was that of Marion Diamond, a neuroanatomist at the University of California at Berkeley, who proved that Einstein's brain had a higher ratio of glial cells to neurons than 11 ordinary brains. In 1998, Thomas Harvey finally gave up the battle and gave the last fragments of Einstein's brain that he had to Elliot Krauss, his successor as pathologist at Princeton. In 2005, Krauss came back to this incredible case in a series of interviews recorded from his home in New Jersey. After his death, the research on intelligence resumed, but this time without the nugget, because the object that was at the heart of the covetousness finally rested in peace at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Recently, in November 2012, a new study titled Albert Einstein's Cerebral Cortex, a description and preliminary analysis of unpublished photographs was published in the journal Brain. An anthropologist from Florida State University named Dean Falk was at the helm of this umpteenth study, based on the analysis of 14 recently discovered photographs. She writes, although the overall size and asymmetric shape of Einstein's brain are normal, the prefrontal somatosensory, primary motor, parietal, temporal and occipital areas are extraordinary. Einstein's brain would then, according to the last news, present a fourth ridge against three normal people in the midfrontal lobe, a region involved in the preparation of plants and working memory. This is an incredible discovery that may mark the beginning of another episode on the analysis of Einstein's brain. While everyone else has moved on and seems to have moved on, Einstein's brain may have decided that it wasn't finished and that it had more to reveal. I told you this story would give you goosebumps and completely turn your stomach and your brain too. You're shocked, I know. But now that you know the real story of Albert Einstein's brain, you can talk about it around you and impress more than one. For once, you'll be the genius of the bunch. Now, tell us in the comments what you think about this incredible case. Don't forget to subscribe and click here to watch another of our videos.